Hi, I'm Mark Rotrammel, Senior Pastor at First Baptist Church of El Paso. We're glad that you've joined us for our services today. Today we're going to take another step in our series entitled Guidelines, where we are looking at values that shape our community as a church. We'll be in Leviticus chapter 19, so we invite you to grab a Bible and grab a cup of coffee and sit down and join us for our worship services today. It's a wonderful morning. Come and worship our God. Let's stand right now as we ask him to come and fill this place with his presence. up your voice. And I will worship you. I will worship you. I will worship you always. And I will worship you. I will worship you. I will worship you
Baptist Church. What a great day to come here and do this. I want you to walk around, and I want you to find someone that you just love more than anything. Give them a big hug, and then find someone else you've never seen, but you love them more than anything, and give them an even bigger hug. It's great to see you here today. Good morning. We're glad that you all are here to worship together here at First Baptist Church. Welcome here. And if you're visiting for the first time, just an extra special welcome to you. We hope that you uh, have been greeted and that you feel at home uh, here. And whether you're traveling through town, you're just in for the summer, or maybe you're looking for a church home, we would love to know more about you. And so in the pews in front of you, you'll find little cards like this, uh, connection cards. We would love if you would fill one of these out. And a little bit later in our worship time, the offering plates will go around. And if you just drop that in the offering plate, uh, we would just love to let you know more about what's going on here at First Baptist. And you know, you'll hear a little bit more later during the announcement time, but uh, this summer's had a lot of activity already, and we're only about halfway through, so there's still a lot going on with uh, our youth ministry, with border missions and opportunities to serve the area. Uh, so please keep all of those things in prayer over these next couple of weeks. Also, in your bulletin, you will find a Love Works insert, and that was a sermon series that we just finished up a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was a great series, and we had a lot of requests, so we're making uh, sets of it available. So if you're interested, maybe to purchase one for your own family, or maybe you think it'll be helpful to, to pass on to somebody else, um, you can fill this out. They're only uh, $10 uh, for the set, and so we would love for you to uh, use that as a resource. And so these are in the bulletin this morning as well. So we're glad that you're here. We're going to continue worshiping the Lord through music and through the word. So if you'll join me and let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for who you are. Thank you for bringing us here together. And as we just sang that we want to worship you and we want to worship you always, not just on Sunday mornings as we gather as a church family, but through everything that we do, that we worship you with our hearts, with our attitudes, with our words, with our actions, God. And so I just pray that you would just remove any uh, distractions this morning as we gather together, that you would be able to speak to each one here and that you would change us so that we would leave here different than when we came in, that we would leave here more like Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. So growing up at Northgate Baptist Church, there's this one of my favorite songs ever, and um, it's called My Tribute. Andre Crouch used to sing it. And I would sing it because it just fit my voice really good. I used to love it. But I never really thought about those words, about being so in debt, so having so much gratitude that there's just not enough words to express. And that's kind of the complete truth with God is there's just not enough ways for us to thank him for what he's done for us. And so one of the few ways that we can truly thank him is by putting him above all things and worshiping him, allowing everything else to fade away. Just like that old hymn says, the more we put our eyes on him, the more the things of this world disappear. And as we express our gratitude to Jesus today, I want to encourage you to do just that and put all things aside and put God in the place where he belongs. So let's stand together as we sing my tribute.
pray. Father God, we are here this morning, your people, with the only desire to express our heartfelt gratitude for the great God that you are. And so we, we stand in your presence and we praise you. Uh, we express our gratitude by joining you in 
in worship, praising you through these beautiful hymns and uh, the fellowship uh, that we have one with another here in your presence and the prayers and, and just the, the testimony, the living testimonies uh, that we share here this morning of all that you have blessed us with. And we just want to continue expressing our gratitude this morning through our tithes and our offerings. And we don't want to stop there. We want to continue expressing our gratitude by, by giving even ourselves and by continuing to loving you with all our heart, strength, mind, and soul and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. So take this offering Receive it as an expression of our gratitude and love and use it that it may continue reaching out, touching and changing more lives. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You know, we probably don't recognize our musicians as often as we should. Steve, that was beautiful. Thank you, sir. And uh, back on the organ today, Russell Gunstream. Was it a month ago now that you had bypass surgery? Yeah, well, welcome home, sir. Thank you for that. When you see the sign, Handle with Care, emblazoned on a package, what does it say to you? You know, I had the same response from the early service. They just kind of looked at me. I know it's hard to know when you're supposed to speak up and when you're not, so... Let me just help you out. When I see the sign, Handle with Care, emblazoned on a package, that tells me that the contents are fragile enough that I should uh, handle them carefully. Is that the way you see it? You see, that seems to be universal to me, but apparently the people who handled some of Teresa's pictures when we were moving didn't quite understand the sign. Because when we went to unpack some of the boxes that we had that contained pictures that had uh, glass in them, um, we found the glass in multiple pieces on the bottom of the box. Handle with care means that the contents are important and may well be fragile. And failure to handle with care can cause damage. Agreed? That's true for people, you know. That when we fail to handle people with care, then we can certainly cause some damage. I'm sure that you know people, maybe even you are one of those people, who at the hands of someone who was a little rough or a little ruthless or maybe just didn't really pay attention to their words or to their behavior, it may well be that you're here today and you're one of those people who were not handled with care and there has been damage that has occurred to you. Today, we take another step. It's actually the second step in our new series entitled Guidelines. If you have a bulletin there, you can see on the front side of it not only the title but also the subtitle for this. As we look at some of those guidelines, those values, those principles that will guide us as a people to create a culture here that honors Christ and reaches people. Guidelines. The second entry into our series now is actually the first of those guidelines. Last week, I introduced the whole concept and what we're trying to uh, understand as we work our way through this. But today, we're going to be in Leviticus chapter 19, and I would invite you to turn there with us. As we go there, what I want you to get today is that when we intentionally build a culture within our community based on guidelines from God's Word, we will find that we become a welcoming body, a welcoming community to people. Because my premise is that the world is full of people who have been damaged, people who have been hurt, whether it's by other people or circumstances or situations, some even beyond their control. The reality is our world is full of people who need desperately a relationship with Jesus Christ, who need desperately the life that only he can bring. And so when we get the guidelines right, we get the principles right, and we, we build our house according to the tenets of God's Word, we find that we become more healthy. 
and healthy things grow and people are drawn to life. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18 is one of the most foundational directives in all of Scripture. Now, I know some of you are still looking for Leviticus. It's in that part of the Bible that we don't go to very often. So you may have missed that statement that I just made, so let me say it again. Leviticus 19 and the second half of verse 18 is one of the most foundational directives that we find in all of Scripture. Tucked away in one of those pieces of the law that we don't often go to and read. We certainly don't usually hear sermons from this part of the Torah or the law as we know it. This little half of a verse is so intense and so intentional in the way that affects the way we live that we find it referred to over, well, a number of times, at least five times in the New Testament, and really more if you begin to expand the application of it. You find it really all through Scripture. A small piece of one verse that finds its way throughout the thread of Scripture. And here's the principle that it draws for us. People matter. Every once in a while I pause like that in case you get used to me just talking. And then I stop and it makes you go, what did he just say? Here's the principle. Here's the guideline. People matter. And because they matter, we have to treat them well. We have to handle them with care. We'll explore what that means as we go further today, but let me go ahead and and get into this verse. As we come to Leviticus 19, and actually on all sides of it, we're in the law here, and it's part of the holiness code where the children of Israel were given the law, and it, it dictates for them and controls for them, we might say, how they're to live, both with God and with one another. So Leviticus 19, 18, we read this, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people. Now, let me just stop there. This is not the sermon. This is, this is extra. You don't have to pay for this part today. Most, most of us prefer to kind of skip over that first part of the verse. Do not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people. Here's the part I want us to focus on today. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then this statement at the end that just puts God's stamp of approval on it. God's, uh, if you will, the authoritative seal. He says, I am the Lord. That's a simple verse. And actually, it may look like there's not that much there for us to look at, but I think as we begin to unpack that, we may find that we really struggle with some of this verse sometimes, and we're not the first ones to struggle with it. Here's the big picture of what I'd like to get to today. As a matter of fact, we're going to take this apart as we work our way through for the structure of this message. Here's the first part. How I treat people is an outgrowth of how I view people. And how I view people is an outgrowth of that to which I attach myself. So let's explode that out and unpack it some. Here's the first part of it. How I treat people grows out of how I view people. That statement itself is a bit challenging. Now, maybe it doesn't seem like it because on the surface, most of us would readily say, well, of course, I I view people fine. How I view them, of course, it impacts how I treat them, but I view people as basically okay. Well, you're not the one who came up with that phrase that says, I've had enough of people. Or, as my dad used to say it, you don't have to be a cannibal to be fed up with people. And you have some of those people in your circle, I'm sure. How do you view people? You want to know how you view people? Look at how you treat people. That's the basic idea here. But our problem, the reason this is a little tricky for us is because we tend to have selective viewing. In other words, I view this group of people quite well, but I view this group of people with suspicion, and I view this other group of people with outright antagonism. So I want you to just think for a moment. Work through the circles of your life Who are the people that you view well? How do you treat them? 
Who are, the few, who are the people that you don't view quite so well and how do you treat them? Maybe it's easier if you do this if you turn it the other way around and talk about how people treat you. Uh, I have a podcast that I listen to on a regular basis. Uh, it's part of my own personal growth and development and continuing education. And I find that the, the uh, people who run this particular podcast have some really good things to say. And on one occasion, uh, there is part of this podcast uh, history, what they've done in the past. And I was back through, I was working through some of their back issues. And, uh, and there was an interview with a guy named Horst Schultze. Now, you may not know the name, but you probably know something, at least maybe some of you by experience, of Horst Schultze's work. He is the CEO, and he's in charge of the Capella Hotel Group, among which hotel group there is this group of hotels called the Ritz-Carlton. And Horst and his people have won numerous customer service excellence awards through the years. As a matter of fact, one person says that he is uh, without peer in that field. And so they brought him into this podcast, and they began to talk to him about how, and this is a Christian-based, a leadership for church kind of a podcast, and they began to talk to him about how he was able to change the culture of his group of hoteliers and how they got to the point of being so head and shoulders above the crowds. Here's one of the statements that was made there. Creating world-class service requires that an, out, that an organization know what the customer wants and how to respond to what they want. Now, I would submit to you, and I'm going to read it again in just a second, but I would submit to you that that is a statement about viewing people now, it is a particular group of people, customers to be exact, but when he settles into who he is and how he teaches other people to be really excellent at customer service, he says this drives them. Creating world-class service requires that an organization know what the customer wants and how to give it to them. It's an intriguing set of discussions that goes on after that. As he begins to flesh that out and what that looks like in everyday life in a hotel. One of the things that they realized, based on some of the uh, metrics that they ran and some of the surveys that were done, it was that the people who come in to frequent their hotels, uh, as a rule, that person makes a decision about the service that they get at that hotel in the first 20 seconds that they walk in the door. I want you to think about that. How quickly does 20 seconds go by? How much time do you have to make an impression that helps govern how they view who you are and what you do? 20 seconds. And so because of that, part of what he did with his people, all the way up and down the line, from the very lowest person, which is where he started out, by the way. He's a CEO now, but he started off on the lowest rung on the totem pole or on the ladder. And from the very lowest person all the way up to whoever's running that hotel, if somebody walks into a room where they are, they are taught to drop everything that they're doing and acknowledge that person as being there. I would submit to you that Horst Schultze and his people know what it means to view people well because people matter. Now, for them, the goal is to make money. And those are customers. And so they see those people not only as an interruption to whatever task they're doing, because they are going to be that, but they see them as a person who needs to be acknowledged. Now, I don't want to ask you if you were acknowledged in the first 20 seconds when you got to church today. But I will say that one of the things that a church that is healthy does well is that it handles people well because people matter. You get that on the receiving end, don't you? Go back through your experiences with various businesses of this week and the people that you have interacted with over the past week as a customer to their business. And my suspicion is that those people who handled you well left a positive impression with you. But the people who didn't may well have lost a customer forever. This week, Teresa, now we had a house full of people this week. I'll get to that in a little bit. We did survive, you can see. Um, but 
Teresa had an issue with some stuff for her mother, and so her mom lives in Odessa and is uh, in assisted care, and so Teresa spent an hour on the phone with a customer, okay, I'm going to do air quotes, okay, with a customer service representative. Now, I use air quotes because to put it in writing would, well, let's just say this. She spent an hour on the phone with this person and finally had to hang up and drive down to the local branch in order to get resolution. How do you handle people in your individual life and in your Christian life? Because after all, what we're really talking about today is in the context of being a follower of Jesus Christ. The first part of this, how I treat people grows out of how I view people. So then the question probably needs to be, okay, so how do I view people? And the short answer, the one that we would probably all readily give or at least acknowledge, is that the way I should view people is the way God views people. Would you agree with that? All right, that's a little bit marginal. That's all right. We'll give you some time. To think through that, how I view people ought to be the same way that God views people, which drives us into this verse. So let's go back to Leviticus 19 in the second part of verse 18. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's a familiar text. We may not see it as familiar immediately, but we know that we've heard it before. And one of the reasons that you've heard it before is because it finds itself all through Scripture. As a matter of fact, you can turn with me to Mark chapter 12 because we'll be there for a little while now. In Mark chapter 12, we find Jesus making reference to this, quotes it directly as a matter of fact. And the context of that is that Jesus is talking and the, the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, are after him. They are after him because he is turning the world upside down because people matter to him. And he handles them really well. Don't miss this truth. When we get handling people right, people, especially hurting people, are drawn to life. Jesus is the best example there ever has been of that. And so in Mark chapter 12, we find Jesus as he makes this statement. Let me just go ahead and read it all. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he answered them, well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Now, let me make sure that we're on the right page together about what's happening here. Jesus is really in the latter part of his ministry here, and he's said enough already that the religious leaders are trying to trap him. They don't really care for him too much. Here's the way we could say that in terms of this message. They viewed their own people quite well, but they didn't view Jesus and his people well at all. As a matter of fact, they're trying to set him up, and so this is one of those times where they throw a question at him, and there's no really good answer as far as they're concerned. Their rabbis have been debating for a long time, which is the greatest commandment. They're trying to trap him. And if he says, well, this commandment is the greatest, they know that he's going to alienate a bunch of people because they would have said it's a different commandment. And if Jesus gave one that none of them said, then they would have branded him as a heretic and said, see, he doesn't even get the right answer on something as simple as this, even though they couldn't come up with the right answer themselves. Which is the greatest commandment of all, the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is... Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord, excuse me, the, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind and with all your strength. And we stop there for just a moment and we recognize that what Jesus has done is gone to the Old Testament, to the book of Deuteronomy, and he's picked up on this fundamental teaching in life and that is that God must be first. The word love there is not that sappy, emotional kind of love that you see with two people who are engaged to be married. This is the kind of love that actually is a business agreement. In the book of Deuteronomy, the word that's love, that you love there in the Shema is one that is a contract. It's a contract between one who has great authority and one who has no authority, and it's the one that says, the greater authority says that I will care for you if you will be loyal to me. That's the word love in Deuteronomy. Jesus goes to that, and essentially this commandment is the one that says, I, as a Christian, a follower of Christ, I will put God first in all things in my life. 
If Jesus just stopped there, he would have alienated some of them, although they would have known the truth of what he said. But he didn't stop there. Verse 31, the second is this, and then he quotes Leviticus 19, 18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater to, than these. And so what we find Jesus saying with this then is that basically it is this agreement that we have that my relationship with God will be first. But he immediately attaches to that something that they never did, and that is that my relationship with God will be first, but my relationships with you will also be of primary importance in my life. We might say it this way. With what Jesus teaches us here, you cannot be in right relationship with God if you're not in right relationships with people. This is why I say this is a tricky thing for us. Because most of us view people specifically. Well, they're my people, and so I view them well. But there's that other group of people. Maybe it's a socioeconomic class. I hope it's not true, but it could be the color of their skin. It could be just the way they treat you. It could be a family feud. But there's always, for many people, there's always that other group of people who don't quite measure up. The, the religious leaders were no different than that. So they take that love from the Old Testament as it's pulled into the New Testament. And we just spent several weeks working our way through that. Love is that investment in the life of another person to raise them to a level they could never get to on, the own, on their own. You put those two together and love now becomes one of those obligations we have with people to do and to handle them in ways that's best for them, even if it costs me something. Well, the religious leaders didn't care for that approach. And so they're looking for trap doors. And they've already lost the question on love because that's pretty well established by this time. So they decide that they would push the issue with Jesus at the point of, well, then who's my neighbor? And they failed the test of how they view people. Because who's my neighbor is just another way of saying, I don't intend to love everybody. So my neighbor gets to be who I want them to be. Churches, some churches, really struggle with this. Because we have those people that are our people, but we, don't, we also have those people that are not really our people. The religious leaders had that problem and so they lay it before Jesus. That's where we continue reading here. Jesus says, there's no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all their heart, with all their understanding, and all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Jesus said, well, you're not far from the kingdom with that. And then in another place we find says, well, who is my neighbor? really. And then Jesus proceeds to tell the story of the good Samaritan. Without going into all of that today, let me just kind of summarize that this way. Jesus taught him that there is no escape clause. There's no trap door that you can get through when it comes to loving people. People, all people, not a few people, all people matter. If we want to see people as God sees people, all people matter, and we need to handle them accordingly. See, the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders, didn't do that very well. If you want to know, then later this afternoon, go to Matthew chapter 23, where Jesus issues a series of statements that are woes, W-O-E-S. And he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, because, and then he gives the reason. And one after another, he takes them to task for the way they viewed people and the way they treated people. And these same people who would say, you have answered correctly, it is all about loving God and loving people. They didn't love all people. So the religious answer isn't automatically the right answer. How do you view people? And if the question immediately pops into your mind, which people then it might be some working place there for you. How should we view people? Jesus gives us a good answer to that. You can write these down and come back to them later, but 
Jesus didn't fall into the scheme of the religious leaders who had their pet group of people. Jesus loved everybody. Jesus wasn't limited by traditions. Jesus wasn't limited by their interpretation of the law. Jesus took it straight to the heart. And so on the Sabbath, of all times, on the Sabbath, when the love God contract would have reigned supreme for the religious leaders, on the Sabbath, Jesus finds himself, this is in Mark chapter 3, the first six verses, Jesus finds himself in the synagogue ready to worship on the Sabbath, and one of the men there has a withered hand. And because people matter and how you treat them is based on how you view them, Jesus broke what their tradition was and he healed the man on the Sabbath because people matter and how we treat them matters. Jesus didn't only do that kind of stuff on the Sabbath. He also went to places where some of the people that didn't matter in first century religious life lived at one point, this is Mark chapter 5, the first 20 verses, he goes into the region of the Gerasenes, and there he encounters a guy. All indications are that Jesus goes there intentionally, maybe just to meet this guy. But this guy has, a, 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 well, not just a demon, he got demons. And he was one that the whole society of Jewish life had relegated out to the nothingness of the region of the Gerasenes, and he was up there on that plateau, and he was living among the tombs, it says. He was a no-touch kind of a person for society. Jesus went to him, and he drove those demons out. He changed his life because people matter. We find this with Jesus time after time, where he takes the people that the religious leaders would have said, those are not our people. That's not my neighbor. I don't have to deal with him well. People like the woman at the well, we find in the book of John, chapter 4, I think it is. We find other times Jesus and the woman who has taken in adultery, those that the religious crowd said, well, we've got to kill her now, or we want to kill her now. And Jesus says, well, hang on just a second, because she matters too. We find people like Zacchaeus and Matthew, who became one of his disciples, even though he was, of all things, a tax collector, because people matter. All people matter. You see, if we're going to get this right, we create a culture. Actually, I believe this culture is already in our church. So this is not one of those things that like, hey, we need to get on the ball. This is one of those things that I think we get right, but we need to call it what it is and make sure that we continue to get it right. Because I think in this church, people do matter. And I think all people matter to us. Individually, we may have our little uh, trip up points with that. But the reality is, I believe, I see in this church this commitment that says people matter. And we're going to meet them in such a way that we handle them with care. But if we ever lose sight of that, if we ever opt for even one day where anybody, any somebody doesn't matter, then we can do enough damage in one day and one encounter with one person to drive them away from God himself because of the way we handle them. People matter. We have to see them the way that God sees them. As a matter of fact, that's really the key to this whole thing because if we just go from our religious background, then religion is one of the greatest separating things in all of history. And so we'll, we'll gravitate into it where some people matter and some people don't. We'll see them that way. If we just go with causes, just the people of my cause matter, then we have the very real possibility of handling somebody without care and doing damage to them. Sometimes even our traditions cause us to draw lines between people where some matter and some don't. But with God... All people matter. You know how I know that about God? Because John 3, 16, as simple a verse as that, for God so loved his group. That's not what it says, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. With God, people matter. 
So with God's people, people must matter. When we view them the way he does, we treat them well. That leads me to the last statement. Here's what I've said. How I view people impacts or grows out of, excuse me, let me say it the other way. How I treat people is an outgrowth of how I view people. But how I view people grows out of that to which I attach myself. We've spent some time here talking about how God sees people. If you struggle with that and pulling that off in your Christian life, just attach yourself to him. I told you last week that Teresa and I were going to be in a week-long experiment, a cultural adaptation experiment, because my daughter and her husband and two kids were coming to spend the week with us. Oh, what a week it was. And they went home yesterday, and as hard as it was to see them leave, there was a part of Teresa and me both that went, we made it. But here's one of the great things that happened, that that God used several things through the course of the week, but on this particular one, God used to help me to come back to some truth, spiritually speaking. I have a four-month-old granddaughter. Her name is Lennon. And um, several times through the course of the week, I sat down on our couch and I put Lennon in my lap, sort of in my lap, uh, and her head was right underneath my chin and she was looking out. That's kind of the way I like to hold babies. That way when they spit up, it goes different places. (laughs) And so I was holding Lennon several times. And as I held her there, uh, her head was here, and so I just kind of wrapped my arms around her so she didn't fall out. And I could feel her heartbeat. And it reminded me something about what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ when we attach ourselves to him and he holds us like that. Not only does he feel our heartbeat, But as I'm sure was true for my granddaughter, if she could have verbalized it, she would have been able to say that she could feel my heartbeat too. You see, when we attach ourselves to Jesus, his heartbeat becomes our heartbeat for people. He is the one who went to the cross for people because people matter. And the closer I walk with him and the more I attach myself to him, the more his heartbeat becomes my heartbeat. Not only that, but with Lennon's head positioned right here and she's looking out, uh, I had the opportunity to see what she was looking at. So if she would turn her head, I would look over to see what it was that caught her eye. But you know what I think is also true? When we crawl up into God's lap like that, so to speak, then we begin to get the vantage point that he has as he looks at other people. It's hard to love some people. Matter of fact, from a human vantage point, it might even be pretty close to impossible to love some people. But as the people of God, we don't have the option of not loving people because people matter to him. And his vantage point of seeing that person needs to drive the way we see that person. That to which we attach ourselves definitively impacts the way we see people. If we attach ourselves to a cause, then we're going to see people either for or against our cause. If we attach ourselves to tradition, then we will see people only to either for or against the tradition that we prefer. If we attach ourselves just because of some religion somewhere, then by definition there are going to be other people who will be against us. But we are God's people. And he is our God. And he says to us, love your neighbor as yourself. I said last week that healthy things grow. My experience with this is that as a church continues to get this part right, that people matter and we treat people like they matter, we handle them with care, I've found that a culture and a community is built 
that it's very welcoming to people who have been damaged by other people. One of the things that helps a church grow is when churches get God's love for people right consistently. I had an experience of that. A church I served in New Mexico a long time ago now. There was a boy in that community. He was Mr. Wonderful at high school. You know the guy, right? Big man on campus. He was the star athlete. He was the one that all the girls, well, not all the girls, but some of the girls wanted to really be around, and guys, you know, kind of clung to him. He was the one that people followed around all the time. Uh, and Robert got into some uh, substance abuse behavior that uh, took its toll on him. And he went from being the big man on campus to being the one that was, you know, the, uh, the town um, focus of derision. And right before we got there, Robert was driving his car one night. He had been partying, and he rolled his car, and his body was partially ejected through the sunroof. And the injuries that he sustained led him to have some brain issues after that. He was still ambulatory and able to live through most of life, but uh, he had seizures and a number of problems like that. And unfortunately, his background continued to carry sway with the churches in town, including the one that I was serving because in that church, only some people mattered. And so Teresa and I found Robert to be very hungry for love. So we pulled him into our house, didn't really adopt him, but sort of. We just began to let him come whenever he wanted to come and spend time with him and him with our kids. And gradually we began to see some of those other people that were in that church, especially some of the youth workers there, began to reach into Robert's life. And this guy who had been the outcast suddenly found a loving community who accepted him as he was with all of his needs, medical and otherwise. And we watched Robert come to a point in his life where he acknowledged the claim of Jesus Christ on his life. And he found hope. And he found healing. And there was a part of that church that got it right. People matter. This world is full of people who have bad experiences and are hurting. And when a church gets this guideline right, God begins to insert people who need healing into that body. I praise God that our church is a loving church. This is a great place for us to start, a place that I think we get it pretty, pretty right most of the time. But let's never forget and never lose our commitment. People matter, so we handle them with care. Let me ask you to bow your heads, if you will, as we close this service out with our time of invitation. A couple of points of, that I'd like to direct your thoughts to. First of all, if you're one of those hurting people, and you don't know Jesus Christ and the love that he brings to you, then that's where you need to start to get this right. You need to recognize that you matter to God. You matter to him so much that Jesus died on a cross so that you could have a relationship and a real life with him. Sure, that gives you the opportunity to go to heaven when you die, but it also gives you life today, life with the one who loves you. If you don't have that relationship with Jesus Christ, the next few minutes is an opportunity for you to respond to his offer of life to you. If you don't know what that means, how to do that, Dr. Nickel and I will be down front here and we'd be happy to visit with you. It may also be that you're here and you're looking for a church home where people matter. Well, I would say to you with no uh, concerns and nothing to keep me from second-guessing this, this is a great place to call home, a great place to live and to love and to serve God, invest your life in other people and let them invest them in you because people matter here. So this might be a great opportunity for you to say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join this church. I'm going to be part of this church. If you're one who's out there has been hurt by somebody, or maybe you've been doing the one hurting, and you know that you've treated some people wrongly, it's a great time to confess that before the Lord, respond to his life, and his offer. And Father, as we come to this time of invitation and decision, we pray that you would have your way with us. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Let's stand and sing. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Make my life useful to Thee. Hi, I'm Mark Rotrammel, Senior Pastor at First Baptist Church of El Paso. And we're glad that you've joined us for our services today. Today we're going to take another step in our series entitled Guidelines, where we are looking at values that shape our community as a church. We'll be in Leviticus chapter 19, so we invite you to grab a Bible and grab a cup of coffee and sit down and join us for our worship services today. <laughs> 